Well, um, now it's my great honor to, to introduce Joel Richter, who obviously needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, I, I will tell you, though, through this whole process of AFS, um, I, was, I was incredibly, I don't know, I, I guess the word is shocked, and I, I guess maybe that's sort of a theme here about the interactions that we've had as this collaborative approach kind of took form. Because when I, when I first heard of Joel's name probably 20 years ago, I thought, well, I, and I hadn't met Joel, I thought, well, you know, this guy clearly hates surgeons. That's obvious. So this is somebody I, I need to stay away from. And through this whole American Forget Society and stuff, I've learned a lot of things. And I've learned that Joel, Joel is actually more, seemingly more excited about this whole idea of collaboration and pushing foregut towards a collaborative specialty than, than even myself. And it has been a, a, an honor and a privilege and an eye-opening experience to get to know Joel over this, this last year. And I think some of the, the greatest words of wisdom on how to do this and do this right have come from Joel. And so it's my great honor, it's my privilege, and I am blessed to have met him and now got to know him, uh, Joel, to talk about how collaboration is possible. Thank you, Joel. I don't know what to say after Reg told the story of um, first time we met, and um, Tom and I have also had the opportunities to uh, debate each other, but, you know, the realities are when you debate at a GI conference or a surgical conference, that's theater. One has to win, one has to lose. If you go in and you compromise to start with, well, you're never going to have a good debate. You know, that's just hugging and loving and all that business. But now we're talking about the realities of doing well in this area, and I'm going I'm to talk about it from my own personal experience because I am a gastroenterologist, 40 years in practice, trained by Don Castell in motility, but introduced to all the myriad aspects of esophagology, and I mean by that radiology, endoscopy, working with surgeons really as I expanded my career. And when I left Don and I had the opportunity to set up my own swallowing center, it became clear that the only way I was going to be successful was the surgeons I was working with. Because what I love about this profession and what I'm telling to the young people today in esophagology, and this is what we love, is we fix people. We fix people each day we see them. We fix them with their GERD, with whatever potpourri of things that we have to do for them. We fix their achalasia. We fix so many problems, and it's so gratifying, and we don't have to have everyone have our cell phone number and constantly call us because we haven't fixed them because we do a good job. But when you look at these people on this list, these are the surgeons that made me better as I went along. And I want to acknowledge them because that's where my success is as an esophagologist. First working with Norman Halpern when I left Don to go to the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And then my relationship with Tom Rice at the Cleveland Clinic. Tom and I were together for 10 years. I had the pleasure of being with Tom as he went through I think probably for surgeons, maybe a traumatic experience going from doing open operations to laparoscopic operations. And uh, it was a joy kind of being with them as we re evolved through that area. We had about 100 publications together over 10 years. He probably paid me one of the nicest compliments I've had in my career that he said to me he was a better surgeon because he and I worked together. And we're still today very close friends. And then I, I keep wandering around. My kids, the worst thing you can ask my kids is, where were you from? Because they, we 
we've lived in so many places, I just tell my kids, tell them your dad was in witness protection and they'll understand and they won't ask you any more questions about it. But I move in my career for excitement and I keep moving in my career and it gives me the opportunity to meet more surgeons. So now I go back to Philadelphia where I did my original training at Temple Medical School and I meet another surgeon. I'm chair of medicine by that time and my chair of surgery is Dan Dempsey, a GI surgeon. So we're starting all over again in this relationship and again, how much fun it was. And then when I had to cross the roads between being a dean, who would ever want to be a dean, or going back to GI, which I love the most, I had the opportunity to come back down to University of South Florida and about the same time I was being recruited by the Department of Medicine, University of South Florida, Vic Volanovich was being recruited out of Henry Ford, and here again, it was a natural fix. Vic and I had never met each other. We met at DDW at a, uh, a restaurant. We started talking for the first time, two strangers at 7.30 in the evening, and we closed down the restaurant at midnight. And since that day, Vic and Linda and Marcy and I have done a number of things together, and it's just a joy taking care of Vic. Unlike some of the scenarios in here, Vic has not done any anti-reflux surgery on me, uh, but he did take out my gallbladder one time. We had to work that around his vacation and my vacation, but that worked out very well. And then I've had the pleasure with Vic of trying to make the decision we wanted to start doing poems and who was to do poems. And here I was, the head of GI, and my interventional uh, endospice wanted to do poems. But they wanted to do poems because it was procedure. I wanted the person in our swallowing center at the University of South Florida do poems because he understood the importance in the disease. And he and his surgical colleagues are the ones doing poems, and we continue to have a great relationship there. So that's my personal story. But the story that we most know is this story here of these two gentlemen, uh, Tom DeMeester, that we've already acknowledged, but my mentor and close friend and the collaborators in the Hawaii meeting, and I really hadn't thought about it. This is the extension of the Hawaii meeting, Don Costell. This was a celebration we had for Don when he retired at uh, Medical University of South Carolina after 50 years in gastroenterology. So this is all it's about. And none of us can be successful individually because we need each other. We need each other in the academic centers and the centers of excellence, and you need each other in the community. And it's very viable now in the community. We have the technology out there. Most of us in the academic centers of excellence don't have any more technology than each one of you have out there. You just have to talk with each other. You just have to interact with each other. You have to talk about these patients together. Uh, Vic and I have a swallowing conference where we do uh, every Tuesday morning at 7.30. We bring in our GI fellows, we bring in our surgical fellows, we talk about the cases. It's the nicest deal in the world for him because he goes over to clinic and he sees everything about the patient. And it makes for a very nice uh, uh, relationship. So I, I truly believe in a debate situation we have to have winners and losers maybe. And Reg, I don't think you lost, you just made it easy on me. But I think what we have to have are people that collaborate together so that we can be successful because we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of procedures, a lot of new developments over the years. I think the strata may almost be 15 years old. We've had a lot of bumps. We've had a lot of GERD treatments. Uh, that we've done that worked out well in the academic medical centers. And then when they got wider proliferation, they hurt people. And that has caused everybody to be very skeptical about these. But now we have a number of things, the links, the TIFs, the POMS operations, and we're struggling to make those available <coughs> to everybody. And not to have to worry about, am I gonna do a POMS on this patient or a laparoscopic hellermyotomy based on what their insurance is rather than what the right operation is. And basically what we deal with is Medicare and Medicaid services and third-party payers, they want us to do a lot of things. 
And I think in the crescendo to bring out a new product, uh, it's expensive. You require venture capitalists to help you with this and all that. We've got a number of things that we have to do. We have to, you know, prove the procedures have a good outcome. We have to have good or better uh, existing coverage of the alternatives. We've got to have immediate benefit. We've got to have a durable procedure for some years. We've got to have an impact on quality and we've got to demonstrate effectiveness of these procedures. And we really can't do this in a vacuum. I don't think surgeons can do this because they're so involved in developing the new technology and the proudness to do it and then wondering how they're going to be able to teach it and how they're going to be able to take it out in the community. I think we as gastroenterologists have to be more involved in this to help to make sure that the studies are done better. Should we have a sham study? How long should the sham study be? Or in the case of the lynx, if you can't do a sham with a lynx, what can you do? Well, you can do a study exactly like they did of 100 people and make sure that you got that five-year follow-up and it didn't hurt to have that published in the New England Journal uh, the first time it came out. So we're all challenged. And I think only if we're collaborating together are we going to get to where we want to because really what we need to do is we need to expand this collaboration because this collaboration has to be gastroenterologists, surgeons, they've got to be the various companies that uh, are, have invested large amounts of money. Hopefully they're going to have some success. But we've also got to get these third-party payers. Medicare, TRICARE is easy. Uh, if you get a CPT code, you can move along with that. But really to expand this and make it available, and they're asking a lot of questions. They want to make sure these procedures are doable by more than just a handful of centers of excellence in the country. We've got to have better science. I tell you, when you use symptoms as your driving force, you don't really realize how powerful a placebo surgery is. And therefore, when we're talking about anti-reflux surgery, we've got to be talking about pH as a primary endpoint, not a secondary endpoint. And when you're talking about POM surgery or various things about achalasia, then you've got to talk about opening up that esophagogastric junction, either as measured by endoflip technology or even a more uh, easier study to do the time barium esophagram. We've got to do large multicenter studies, and those are hard, particularly when they're sham studies, but Indostem is showing us how to do it. This FDA study that we're doing right now, it will probably end up having 200 patients. I'm amazed where these patients come from because none of these patients are actually coming from Vic Volanovich or my practice. They're coming from Facebook. The patients want something better. They're willing to sacrifice as part of a sham. We want to make sure that we do a good job and then we follow up with these patients. And since with GERD and with achalasia, one year data as far as I'm concerned means nothing. What's one year in the life of a GERD patient? What's one year in the life of an achalasia patient? We want to know data, I think, for at least five years and even further. And so these studies allow us to do this. And oftentimes, the patients can get a lot of these investigations done free. And then one of the challenges is, and, and it's hard, but I wonder if this is one of the things that the insurance companies are going to be knocking us back on is when we say that we've got a procedure that's as good as the Nissen, or we say that we have a procedure that is good as the Heller myotomy, but we haven't proved it. We haven't done a randomized study. We say it's too expensive. We say who wants to fund it? Well, boy, we're just playing into the insurance companies. The insurance companies are saying, you're making it easy on us. So I think we've got to find out how to handle that, and I think we'll find really a much better assessment of how good the new studies are. And I don't think they're going to lose. I think we're just going to figure out that in certain situations they are better than the gold standards. 
but they also may have some problems and we've got to figure out how to do. The other thing is we have to find a reliable way of looking at the safeties of these procedures because GERD does not kill patients and achalasia does not kill patients. So we can't have procedures that are dangerous. And one of the issues that we deal with is when the procedures go from center of excellence out in the community, depending on the training, how can we make sure there's not adverse events? Or if there's adverse events, how can we make sure that they're adequately recorded? Pharmaceutical companies have to report all their side effects to the FDA the first five years that the drugs are out. All of their side effects. The MAW database is only a voluntary database. And if you don't want to show your mistakes, nobody forces you to, and you don't get a civil lawsuit or anything like that. So we've got to do something better. And then the other thing we've got to commit to in certain areas is getting a better understanding of the durability of the new procedures. And with POEMS, we've got to be dedicated, I think, all of us together. Because remember in POEMS, we're doing something totally different than we did before. And Bill Richards told us in 2004 that the funnel application was important. But in the enthusiasm for new technology, we seem to forget this. So we're taking a disease, achalasia, and now converting it to another disease, scleroderma. And we know the natural history of scleroderma. The natural history of scleroderma untreated is to have bad reflux disease, is to have Barrett's esophagus, and to have adenocarcinoma. We do not want that to happen with poems. So we have to get a registry together and follow these patients carefully. So it's an exciting time. It's a time that we're not debating pros and cons. We're debating the realities of these things, how we can make these procedures safe, how we can make these durable, how we can anticipate the long-term consequences so at the end we can look back as a group of gastroenterologists and surgeons working together said, we've done right. We've done what Tom Demeester and Don Costell and everyone tried to do in a smaller format. Now we can do it in centers of excellence and these centers of excellence can be done in the academic medical centers, but they can also be done in the communities if well-trained surgeons and well-trained gastroenterologists work together. So it's a tremendously exciting time, I think, for the young people, both in surgery and in gastroenterology. This is a great time to be involved in the esophagus, and that's the reason I'm involved with this society. Thank you very much.